May 2006, this man, Congressman Smith, introduced this bill to the United States Congress called the Orphan Works Act of 2006. The aim of the bill was to assure easier access and use of something called, quote, orphaned works, meaning copyrighted works or works presumptively copyrighted, whose owner could not easily be identified. Now, in principle, I've been a strong supporter of orphan works legislation, but in this case, I'm not a supporter. And my aim in this overly long, overly professorial explanation is to say just why. But let's begin with some background. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the United States Constitution grants Congress the power to, quote, promote the progress of science by securing for limited times exclusive rights to authors for their writings. Now, the critical passage in this grant of power is, first, that the purpose of the grant is to promote the progress of science, and second, that the grant is to be for just a, quote, limited times. Limited times meant something real in the framers' conception. In 1790, the first Copyright Act was enacted, granting copyrights for a term of 14 years. That initial term was renewable just once to a maximum of 28 years. But the copyright and the renewal were not automatic. Instead, the original copyright regime had a system of formalities built into it. The copyright owner had to register the work, mark the work, deposit the work or the copyright depository, and renew the copyright in order to get the full benefit of copyright protection. The vast majority of published works never registered to receive an initial copyright, and the vast, vast majority of published works didn't renew the copyright, and thus most entered the public domain immediately, and more than 90% entered the public domain after just 14 years. Copyright in this time was a tiny regulation of a tiny part of the creative market. Now, more importantly, because the reach of this regulation was just to regulate the, quote, printing, reprinting, publishing, and vending of copyrighted works, this law was, in effect, no regulation of ordinary citizens, ever. The law regulated commercial entities primarily, those engaging in the acts of publishing and republishing. It left citizens alone. Now, the framers' rule survived for 186 years in the American tradition, between 1790 and 1976. While the copyright term increased, the rule of formalities, the core feature of the traditional contours of American copyright, remained unchanged. The system was an opt-in system for copyright protection. The majority of work never got the benefit from that opt-in. The vast majority never got the benefit of a renewed term. The public domain in this world was large and relevant, and the law regulated very few. As Professor Jessica Littman put it in 1994, at the turn of the century, the last century, U.S. copyright law was technical, inconsistent, and difficult to understand. It didn't apply to very many people or to very many things. So the law applied to people who produced these things, but it didn't apply to people who produced these things or these people, most importantly, the ordinary consumer. The ordinary consumer, as Professor Lippman put it, could go through life, quote, without ever encountering a copyright problem. This was a small regulation of an important industry with no real regulation of the consumer. In 1976, this system radically changed. The 1976 Copyright Act rejected the rule of our framers and embraced the rule of the French. We abolished formalities, abolished the opt-in system of copyright, and instead adopted an opt-out system of copyright, where copyright was automatic, applying to every creative work when fixed in a tangible form, and effectively forever. This radical change in law has produced a radical change in the effect of the law, again because of digital technologies. For if copyright at its core regulates something called copies, then in the digital world the one thing we know is that every single use of creative work produces a copy. Thus every single use triggers copyright in the digital world. Every single use in this sense is presumptively regulated. 
So again, Professor Littman in 1994. Ninety years later, the U.S. copyright law is even more technical, inconsistent, and difficult to understand. More importantly, it touches everyone and everything. Most of us can no longer spend even an hour without colliding with the copyright law. The law has become a huge regulation of creativity, and again, importantly, for the first time, it reaches and regulates ordinary citizens. Now, the orphan works debate got triggered in 1998 when the United States Congress passed a statute that was named in honor of this man, Congressman Sonny Bono. The Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act extended the term of copyrights, existing copyrights and future copyrights, by 20 years. This was the 11th time that Congress had extended existing copyrights in the past 40 years, and the fundamental question people might ask about that extension was why? What motivated Congress to extend existing copyrights? The obvious answer is that there are very few valuable copyrights copyrights by people such as these, and the owners of those copyrights urgently pleaded to Congress that Congress grant them more protection, more protection by extending the copyright term that they had received by another 20 years. This man didn't like that change very much. Eric Eldred read the copyright clause in the Constitution to see that the purpose of the copyright clause was to, quote, promote the progress of science, and saw that the means to affecting that end were to secure copyrights for, quote, limited times. And Eric asked, well, how could the term be limited if it can always be extended? And he asked, how could it be that you're promoting progress when you extend the term for works already existing? In 1999, Eric Eldred launched a constitutional challenge to this statute. That, that challenge rested first on what he called the progress clause limitation. Eric's claim was the ability to extend existing terms violates the plain meaning of what the framers thought they were getting by limiting terms to limited times. And secondly, he based the claim on the First Amendment saying that when you extend the term of copyright for an existing work, you're restricting speech without getting any speech in return, because, again, the work that is being protected has already been created. Now, this case worked its way up to the Supreme Court, and I was Eric's lawyer. And in the Supreme Court, we argued that if the court intended to enforce the meaning of the framers' constitution, they ought to restrict the power of Congress to extend the term of existing copyrights. That claim suffered a total defeat. By a 7-2 to two majority, the Supreme Court basically said that Congress was free to extend the term of existing copyrights. They were free to extend so long as each extension was for a limited time. Now, after that decision, I had a kind of sinking feeling in my stomach, a kind of honey, I shrunk the Constitution moment. And more fundamentally, I realized that the way this case had been understood by the Supreme Court and many in the public was a fundamental mistake. The case had been framed as if it was a case about Mickey Mouse, as if it was a free Mickey campaign. But the real issue in this case has nothing to do with Mickey Mouse. It has nothing to do with the 2% of copyrighted works that continue to have some commercial value after 75 years. The real issue in this case had to do with the balance of creative work, balance that was commercially unavailable, balance that had been orphaned by a system of regulation that made it impossible to access and build upon that work because the copyright owners could not even be identified. So, for example, in the Eldred case, the copyright owners for some of the Laurel and Hardy works filed a brief to the Supreme Court, first saying, of course, they make millions of dollars every time Congress extends the term of existing copyrights. But as they argued, unless the Supreme Court struck down that extension, a whole generation of American film would simply disappear. Now, why would it disappear? Well, because the copyright system is so inherently inefficient, you can't know the owners of the copyrighted work that continues to be protected by the regulation of copyright. 
Uh, and so only when the copyright expires can you actually get access to the work and restore it in a way that's safe from the claims of others after you've done the work to restore the work, to, to restore the original work. But with film, by the time this copyright expires, the film will literally have turned into dust. So the copyright extension will guarantee that a whole swath of American culture will be gone before we even have the opportunity to preserve it. This is the problem of orphaned works. These are works orphaned by law. This was the real question in the Eldred case, not whether Mickey should be freed, but whether this extension of copyright was unduly burdening access to work that was presumptively not even commercially accessible, burdening access for the purpose of preserving or building upon a culture that had been forgotten by the commercial world, but not forgotten by those who knew and studied and loved that culture. Now, shortly after this decision, almost as an act of contrition, I wrote an op-ed that appeared in the New York Times. And in that op-ed, I focused on precisely this problem with orphans. And to solve the problem with orphans, I suggested a proposal. The proposal was that 50 years after a work had been published, the copyright owner simply send into the copyright office a simple form and pays $1. So if you paid the $1 fee, then you got the full term of copyright protection. If you didn't pay the $1 fee, then your work passed into the public domain. Now that proposal generated lots of support, and an online petition produced about 22,000 signatures in a very short time, demanding that Congress do something about the problem of orphaned works. And one Congresswoman, Congresswoman Lofgren, took the lead and introduced a bill, which she called the Public Domain Enhancement Act, a bill designed to facilitate exactly this kind of filter by requiring after 50 years that someone file a form to get the benefit of the full term of copyright. This proposal was supported by many public interest groups, including public knowledge, and it was pushed to make Congress aware of the importance that gets some action from Congress in return. Senators Hatch and Leahy took the lead in asking the Copyright Office to study this problem. And shortly thereafter, the Copyright Office launched the study of the orphan works problem to determine whether indeed this was a problem that deserved legislative uh, re response. Now, the Copyright Office last year produced a report that addressed this question of orphaned works. This is an extraordinarily important report. I also think it's an extremely well-done report. It's the first comprehensive study of the problem of orphan works, and it concludes that orphan works are a real problem. But more importantly, this was a study done in an open, transparent process. The Copyright Office was extraordinarily responsive to comments filed in the process and responsive to the suggestions made by people for different ways to solve the problem of orphan works. But after they reviewed all the comments, the Copyright Office came up with a proposal. The proposal went something like this. If you can't find the copyright owner to a particular work after what the report calls a, quote, reasonably diligent search, then the report says the copyright's owner's rights should effectively be curtailed, limited, so that the rights the copyright owner has are less than the rights granted originally under the Copyright Act. In May 2006, Congressman Smith took that proposal and turned it into a bill, and this bill was what was introduced in Congress as the Orphan Works Act of 2006. Now, there's lots that's good in this bill and in this report from the Copyright Office. First, it's good that it recognizes there's a problem here. Second, it's good that it recognizes that owners have a role in helping to solve the problem. But as well as the good, there's lots that's bad in both this report and the structure of this bill. The bad can be summarized quite simply as first, that the report and bill go too far. And second, they don't go far enough. Let's start with the first. Remember, the Orphan Works proposal by the Copyright Office effectively curtails the rights the copyright grants. If after a, quote, reasonably diligent search, you can't find the copyright owner. If that's true, then your rights are curtailed. It applies 
to first all work, both foreign and unpublished work, as well as published domestic work, and it applies immediately, meaning to all copyrights now existing and copyrights immediately after they have been produced. Now, in my view, both of these features are very bad, indeed extraordinarily unfair to copyright owners. Think about the foreign copyright owner or the copyright owner of an unpublished work. Exactly what must they do to make sure that they can be, quote, re found after a reasonably diligent search? How can they make sure that they can be found? This is especially unfair to authors who produced work between 1978 and today. For since 1978, as I explained in describing the 1976 Copyright Act, the law has basically said, don't worry about formalities. And so there's an extraordinary range of creative work. Indeed, think of the millions of photographs taken by photographers who have relied upon this rule and other works too, works that have been produced relying upon this rule that said, don't worry about formalities. Don't worry about whether someone can find you, because whether or not they can find you, they're not allowed to use your work without your permission. Now, for Congress to come in now and change that rule is extraordinarily unfair and creates a very big problem for these creators. For how do they go about protecting their work now that the rules have been changed? How do they go back and fix the work that they've published that might not be published in a way that makes it easy to identify or discover the copyright owner after a reasonably diligent search. This is deeply unfair to creators. And more importantly, as I'll describe more, it's unnecessary given the legitimate objectives of the Copyright Office's proposal. So that's the problem with the Copyright Office's proposal going too far. Here's the way in which it doesn't go far enough. The Orphan Works remedy proposed by the Copyright Office is triggered after a, quote, reasonably diligent search. But what exactly does that mean, a reasonably diligent search? Well, Congressman Smith's statute uh, explains it. Um, a reasonably diligent search is reasonably diligent only if it includes steps that are reasonable under the circumstances to locate that owner in order to obtain permission for the use of the work and... The steps referred to shall ordinarily include, at a minimum, review of the information maintained by the Registrar of Copyrights. A reasonably diligent search includes the use of reasonably available expert assistance and reasonably available technology, which may include, if reasonable under the circumstances, resources for which a charge or subscription fee is imposed. And the information that they report offers to guide these searches says, the Register of Copyright shall receive, maintain, and make available to the public, including through the internet, information from authoritative sources such as industry guidelines, statements of best practices, and other relevant documents that is designed to assist users in conducting and documenting a reasonably diligent search under this subsection. Such information may include, one, the records of the Copyright Office that are relevant to identifying and locating copyright owners, other sources of copyright ownership information reasonably available available to users, methods to identify copyright ownership information associated with the work, sources of reasonably available technology tools and reasonably available expert assistance, and the best practices for documenting a reasonably diligent search. Now, your response to this list of commands about what a reasonably diligent search is or should be should be something like this. Because we should think to ourselves the obvious question, is this really the best they could do? This mess, this mush of definitions and conditions and places you've got to look and things you've got to consult in order to figure out whether there's a reasonably diligent search. This is a system which guarantees permanent employment to lawyers. It's a system that guarantees a permanent cost imposed upon libraries and archives. And it's a system that guarantees permanent uncertainty to users, for they can't know without spending a significant amount of money what work they can, uh, they can use or not. They can't rely upon anything that they've decided they can use without filing a lawsuit, meaning, again, without incurring significant cost. And the consequence of this is a radically inefficient solution to the Orphan Works problem which, though Washington doesn't often recognize this, we should all recognize is no solution at all. We ought to be able to do much better. And in my view, there is a simple alternative that would do much better than the proposal offered by the Copyright Office.
So let's review a bit. So the Copyright Office, I believe, is right. That first, there's a problem here. And second, copyright holders must be part of the solution. Where the Copyright Office goes wrong is when they try to burden all copyright owners with the burden of solving the Orphan Works problem, and when they try to burden users with the mush of something called a, quote, reasonably diligent search. A better solution would look something like this. After a specified term, Copyright owners have an obligation to maintain their copyright in a way that makes it easy for people to identify and get access to them to get permission to use the copyrighted work. Here's the details for what this system would look like. The alternative differs from the Copyright Office at least along these three dimensions. First, who is burdened by this rule? Second, when are they burdened by this rule? And third, what is the burden of the rule? Let's start with when. The Copyright Office proposal says that all works immediately are subject to the orphan works remedy, that you always must be able to identify the copyright owner after a, quote, reasonably diligent search. In my view, that is an unfair and unnecessary burden on the copyright owners. And the alternative I would propose would be very different. But when the copyright uh, when the rule applies will depend a little bit upon when the work was created. So first, for future works, in my view, there should be no orphan works obligation for an initial term. Let's just take the framer's initial term of at least 14 years. For 14 years, the copyright owner should get the full benefit of copyright without any restriction at all, the same protection they get right now without having to worry about the consequences of any orphan works remedy. Second, for work produced between 1978 and today, meaning again, work that was produced under the rules of the Copyright uh, Act of 1976, Again, to protect the fairness to those copyright owners, they too should have a period of time to adjust to the orphan work remedy and not be caught by the uh, change in rules that would impose upon them a burden which they didn't know about when they first created the work. So again, I would say for them, not for 14 years would they be required to comply with any orphan works requirement. But for work produced before 1978, the rule would be somewhat different. For that work was produced under a regime that did require that people abide by formalities, did require that they register their work, and did require that they renew the copyright. It's more fair for them, therefore, to have a burden of copyright uh, formalities imposed upon them. And in any case, that work is so old that presumptively most of that work is no longer commercially accessible anyway. So this proposal would be that for that work, within five years, the rule would apply, meaning in five years, they would be required to comply with the particulars of the orphan work remedy. That is the alternative I'm describing right now. So the difference between the Copyright Office and the alternative is the Copyright Office applies its rule now to everything, and the alternative would apply in 14 years for future works and works created after 1978, and five years for all work created before 1978. Second, what's the difference in what the rule is? Well, again, for reasons I've described, in my view, the copyright's rule is just mush, a reasonably diligent search determined by six factors that apparently must be balanced together to determine whether a search is reasonably diligent or not. That kind of mush is not the kind of clarity the copyright system needs. Instead, the clarity is something like the system that the framers established and that governed American copyright law for 186 years, something of a registry. A simple and efficient registry, think about one click at Amazon, not government forms sent in to bureaucrats hundreds of miles away. And more importantly, this registry would not be government run. Instead, the role of the government would be to define the protocols for an approved copyright registry and then to encourage private companies to build those registries. Now, we have a very clear example of such a registry system that already governs much of our online life. That's the domain name system. So, for example, I have a domain name called Lessig.org. That domain name I purchased from a domain name registry. That domain name registry... Um, serves the function of linking the name Lessig.org to a particular number, an IP address. 
This domain name system then is simply a protocol and registries feed the list of domain names linked to a particular IP address by following that protocol. These registries compete, meaning that many different registries function and compete to drive the cost of registry services down. So the market keeps the costs low and keeps innovation high, and the registries then provide a simple way to make sure that no, no two people have the very same domain name registered to them. Now what I'm suggesting here is a kind of copyright registry equivalent. Government specifies the protocol. The registries then get established to supply efficient registry services for the particular objects that must be registered. The protocol would require that any registry be searchable within this registry system. So we're not talking about separate domains of registries, but instead registries that could be accessible across competing domains. This would keep the cost for the registry low, and that low cost would guarantee that this not be a significant burden to anybody who needs to maintain their copyright after just 14 years. So that's the difference of the alternative, a simple, clear, low-cost system to guarantee registry of work that is within the range of the orphan works re remedy, but that also guarantees that users can get access to that work simply. Now finally, the difference between who is affected by this rule. Under the Copyright Office's proposal, everybody's affected by this rule. Foreign copyright owners, unpublished copyrighted works, and published copyrighted works by domestic copyright owners. In my view, the rule should be narrower. It should apply only to United States copyright owners, so that United States copyright owners or American uh, copyright owners would be required to follow this rule, but no one else will. Now that might raise questions of fairness in your mind, and I concede that those questions must be addressed, and I'll address them in a minute. But the narrowness means that the rule only applies to those that are traditionally considered American copyright owners. Now what would the consequence be of failing to apply by the uh, uh, Orphan Works remedy that I'm proposing? Well. About this, I'm less certain. We could either say that the consequence of failing to comply with the registry requirements would mean that the work would pass into the public domain, or following the Copyright Office, we could say that the consequence of failing to register would be that the work uh, is now available only for limited copyright remedies, much more limited than uh, the copyright remedies provided by the law right now. Clearly, the simplest solution is to indicate that the work passes into the public domain, and that public domain would guarantee anybody confidence that they could build upon this work or transform it without any fear of cost. But it may be that for fairness reasons, the Copyright Office's proposal of limited remedies is uh, supplied as an alternative. Now let's consider some objections to this alternative. The first and most vigorous objection raised to a proposal like this is that it's said to violate the rules of the International Convention for Copyright known as the Berne Convention. Uh, this convention has a rule against formalities, and the view is that anything like a registry requirement would violate that rule. This argument is just false. The Berne Convention is a convention that limits the ability of a country to impose obligation on foreigners. It does not limit the ability of the country to impose obligation on domestic copyright owners. Of course, it would be absurd to require that foreigners register their works in the United States and in every other country around the world, so we don't require that. But we do impose formalities on domestic copyright owners all the time. For example, only American or domestic copyright owners must register in order to sue to protect their copyright. Foreign copyright owners aren't required to register in order to sue. That difference reflects the difference in domestic obligations versus obligations imposed upon foreigners that the Berne Convention was trying to eliminate. So the alternative that I've outlined here is consistent with Berne and indeed consistent with existing American copyright law. The second objection returns to the question about why we're burdening U.S. copyright owners only and not foreign copyright owners. Isn't this unfair to Americans? 
Well, first, the burden of this alternative is actually less than the burden imposed by the Copyright Office's solution, because again, in my view, this solution is simpler than the Copyright Office's solution. It first doesn't apply for 14 years, and second, there's a simple, obvious way to comply with the rule to guarantee that there's no risk of losing your protection under the Copyright Office. But second, we don't burden foreigners, again, for the reasons plainly sensible, uh, of burn, uh, we can't burden foreigners. But that doesn't mean that the United States shouldn't push other countries to adopt similar solutions for their domestic copyright owners. So in my view, every government should be adopting the same kind of principle that requires domestic copyright owners to register within a system that could be searched across registries so that we would burden U.S. copyright owners, the British would burden British copyright owners, and so on. This would build an efficient system internationally, and most importantly, it would minimize the role for lawyers within this system, keeping the cost of complying with the law low. Now, what's to be done about this proposal? Well, if you disagree with me, don't worry. Not much that a single voice outside of the party system can do. But if you do agree with me, then there is something I'd suggest you do. First, you should tell your representatives, both in the House and the Senate, that we want something more than the minimal reform, indeed, I think, harmful reform of the Copyright Office, something that has more fairness to current authors, not burdening them in ways that they didn't expect, and more efficiency in the long run for both users and authors by establishing a clear, simple system to identify which works continue to need the protection of copyright. Second, if you're a librarian, then you need to tell your leadership that you want something more than the compromise that they have agreed to in supporting this Copyright Office's proposal. Tell them that the crumbs that they are accepting from the copyright industry here are not good enough anymore. Librarians stand for one of the most important principles in the copyright system of America, a principle that Thomas Jefferson himself thought was central to what the Progress Clause might achieve. That is guarantee of access to our culture. Now, that guarantee of access will not occur if libraries are burdened with the inefficiency of this, quote, reasonably diligent search requirement, end quote. Instead, what libraries need is a simple way to know how to obey the rules. And that simple way would be achieved by this alternative, not by the compromise that the librarians have been forced to accept. This is an extraordinarily important opportunity that we have right now to protect a public domain. We have a chance here to help authors and to help users, and we need to get it right. No more should we be accepting multi-factored balancing tests that lawyers get to waste resources trying to apply. Instead, we need clear and simple rules so that we can know who owns what and who needs to be asked for permission before someone gets the right to use some bit of our culture. Now, there are two additional reasons that relate to this point about simplicity. First, there are many who say that copyright is property. Well, if that's so, then it's the government's duty at a minimum to make it simple and clear who owns what property. This government has miserably failed to do exactly that. Copyright, if a property system, is indeed the most inefficient property system known to man. And it's time to fix that property system, to make it a system that does easily identify who owns what, so that permission can be sought where permission is necessary. And second, they say that copyright law now should apply to everybody. So grandmas get sued by the RIAA, students get expelled from universities for failing to obey the rules of copyright. Well, if this is so, then we can't write laws that require lawyers in order to understand them. Instead, these rules regulating what is in effect speech need to be simple and understandable so that 99% of the world can know what they should do without needing the benefits of a lawyer at their side. In my view, Congress can do better than the mush of a rule that the Copyright Office has offered them. Indeed, in my view, for most of American history, we did do better through rules that established clear identity of who owned what and a simple way for those who need permission to know from whom they need to seek permission. Now, the digital technologies of the Internet could make these formalities radically more efficient. 
and we could achieve a system where it was simple for anyone to know what they're allowed to do under the copyright regime without needing to hire a lawyer in order to interpret the law and apply it to their efforts to preserve and build upon our past. This is what Congress should be seeking, simple, clear rules to make a property system function more efficiently. Thank you.